Yeah. Is this the first sex scene in a Richard Linklater film? Is that is that true? No, but the the, the best sex scenes, I think. Hey, thanks, man. <laughs> Not the first, but the best. That's how I like to be. Uh... <laughs> Okay, we have to talk about Hitman. Um, this, this collaboration has actually kind of been two decades in the making. What is it like, Richard, to get here with Glenn, remembering <laughs> him as you know, a young, scrappy teenager, and now being the co-writer, producer, yeah. and star of this film? Well, it's been a really fun evolution, obviously. This is the fourth time Glenn and I have worked together. Two of them are very small, kind of one-day parts, many years apart. But uh, the two that we've really dug in on have been super creatively rewarding. And, and this was very different because Everybody Wants Some was a nice ensemble. This was really just him and Adria and, you know, the rest of the, our cast. But it was, I don't know, it was fun. And to start, you know, this whole thing started when I got a call from Glenn asking if I'd read this article. I said, yeah, I read that article a long time ago and I've thought about it a lot, but it just doesn't seem like a movie. And, Glenn's like, well, what if we, you know, it's a great character, great story, you know, we just started from there. It was during the pandemic, we had a lot of time to spend, and we just dug in, and at some point it's like, you know, let's just, let's just write this together, you know, let's, let's start. It was a very interesting dance, because also we wrote this entire thing over the pandemic, yeah. so we were never in the same room. My, my family, <laughs> you know, I spent some time with my family, it was either in Texas or Maine, and I'd be on these, like, family walks we'd go on, and there's pictures of me on these family walks. I don't know if I, I gotta get my yeah, mom to send You were always at a beach somewhere, at a ranch. I was always in the exact same place. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. I was, my I, was library. I was living my best life in the pandemic. Yeah, I know, but, I was like, I don't know how you did it, but, but, but you were having my, a fun pandemic. Yeah, so I was with my family and we'd, I, you know, there's pictures of like the family on the walk and I'd be on the phone with Rick, like yeah. kind of like separate from the group behind. And, and we kind of would just make each other laugh and, yeah, and yeah. be watching a movie and be like, hey, like there was this, you oh, know. Man. Watched Double Indemnity last night. What if we did yeah, because this? this thing allowed us to be really creative. Not only, we were dealing with a nonfiction source because it's true story, true characters, true kind of true crime setup. But then the second part of the movie really required, we just had to leave all that behind and go our own way with these genres. And that's when it got really fun and creative. We were just like, well, what if this, it's like, huh, well, that's funny. You know, can we do that? Has that been done before? Not like that, you know, so. Oh, it was very creative. I think also like the merger of our two brains, like we never painted ourselves into like a tonal box, yeah. like a genre or anything like that. Like I think what was really fun is that this thing never allows the audience to like sit in a tone. So the expectations yeah. are kind of everything, you know, when it comes to character and all that stuff. So I, I found that by the time we got to game day where we're sitting down with a cast and really reading through it and kind of massaging it, yeah. it really, it really became a merger of just best ideas in a room. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like everybody was. And we were mashing up genres too. We were kind of a screwball comedy meets a film noir. You know, we were like, we want to take you on a ride. We want you on the edge of your seat by the end. It's really like, oh my God, the walls, you know, all that. We wanted it to work in the genre, you know, specifics of those genres, which I don't, I don't know. You don't see that a whole lot. Most, uh, you know, we're kind of set up to be kind of a serious film. It's true crime. There's murder on the table. And yet we couldn't take it that serious because it's kind of based on a myth. So it was a great, you know, to make this kind of steamy romance, you know, because I think it's just kind of a hot couple movie, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, since you mentioned a hot couple, yeah. is this the first sex scene in a Richard Linklater film? Is that, is that true? No, but the, the, the best sex scenes, I think. Hey, thanks, man. <laughs> Not the first, but the best. That's how I like to be. Uh... <laughs> That's great. Well, you did a sex scene and everybody wants it. You're one of the few guys who got a sex scene in That's that. true. Remember? That's true. You know, always throwing me sex scenes. I appreciate <laughs> I know, you, Rick. I know. Thanks, man. Um, no, this one, this one was a very interesting, the, the, even how we crafted those, like it was, it was yeah. a team effort, you know? Audrey really was the... Yeah, the she's the secret sauce. Yeah. You know, she's the third. If it wasn't for what Star Wars or whatever the hell, she's they wouldn't let her out. She would be here because she was really our, our partner. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, tell me about Gary slash Ron and Madison and the importance of that kind of rom com element to this movie as well. Well, first off, she's awesome. She's she was so she's just so smart, funny, 
she brought in and we were just like, I don't know, she, she contributed so much to that character and, and the believability between them and the kind of the funny banter. I don't know. We also, it was so fun working with you guys, you know. We had a but, great time. Yeah. I mean, she's, and she's a crazy hard worker, very talented. But also, I remember we were, who we were looking at to play that role. We were writing it. We didn't really have anybody in mind when we were writing it. I don't know oh. if you did, but, like, I, I know that we knew that oh. was sort of the linchpin of everything. If you didn't buy her likability, her humanity, her vulnerability. And let's face it, in a, for the links your character goes to and for the sure. risks you take, she has to be, I, I said it crudely, she has to be the, the one that you would give up everything you've worked for your whole life, everything just to be with. And that's the film noir totally. hero. Yeah. You can't say no yeah. to this opportunity. But Gary's and so he, binary, that's, yeah. You get yourself in trouble. Like, she has to be that. So that weeds out almost everybody on the planet. Yeah, you have to have some special <laughs> magic, and Audrey really does have that magic, like, yeah. you know. And, and also, she does some pretty crazy things in this movie that you have to yeah. continue to root for. So, um, yeah, she's, we, we, I remember, remember getting the call from Rick, he's like, look, I don't want to tip the scales, but I think we found her. You can meet her. You know, you obviously, you know, you got to do your thing. But, like, I'll be curious how you guys hit it off. But you I'm can just... tell he had the best first date ever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I had the, uh, had the, best, had the... the best first date ever. Audrey is that, that special. Like... Yeah, I knew we were off to the races when you were meeting her, let's say, like, 4 in the afternoon my time. I expected to get a call from Glenn around 5, 5.30. I didn't hear from him. It was, like, 9 at night. I'm like, that must have not gone. I don't know. And I... Like, hey, and you're like, yeah, we were together five, four or five hours. Uh, we just kept ordering drinks. And yeah. <laughs> that's great. I'm like, okay, we'll be, we'll be fine. We'll here. be fine. Yeah, I read there was tequila involved. Yeah. Uh, so yes, yeah, mezcal. She's, she's, yeah. she's got a fine palate. You know, we, had, we, had, uh, we were both on dry January at the time and, and really dumped that like 10 minutes into our hang. Right, right. You know? <laughs> well, okay, tell me about Gary's transformations because part of the fun of this movie, how many different ones did you actually end up doing as he's pretending to be all these different hitmen? And did you have a favorite? We also had to like, we also had to trim them down a Yeah, bit, we cut you know? a few on, on paper, but yeah. every one we filmed, we used. We yeah, we used every yeah. one we filmed. We didn't have the time or budget to mess around there, but uh, that, I think that's one of the most fun, weird elements of this movie. And Glenn really just went off the deep end here with the accents. And he was reading books on like how character, and this is not just for those characters, but the Ron Gary kind of blur, how they walk differently and talk differently, hold themselves, you know. So it was a real tightrope walk Glenn was doing with all these people. And believability, but not too, but still it could be silly because the whole thing's kind of ridiculous. And yet, I don't know. Do we have a favorite? Well, I mean, it's like, but also like the. I love them all in their own way, you know. We, we have a, we have this funny picture in the hair and makeup trailer where you have like sort of all the different faces on there. Yeah. But yeah, we had these fun reveals every time. Should be an album cover or some kind. <laughs> I don't know. What, I like that. Oh, you're different. That's a personas. great idea, actually. Releasing the, the music in this album. movie. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was like a, kind of an interesting part to play all these different roles because you're not. It's not. Um, the nutty professor. You're not playing, you know, different people. You're playing different people on top of a specific person. So you have to build those layers in a very specific way and kind of show cracks in the the character. Like people still want to see Gary under under some of these things. You know, like when you're playing Ron, it's not a perfect performance. You know, you don't want to see a perfect performance. Yeah, you want to see a guy, you know, you know, missing the gear shift, so to speak, every <laughs> once in a while. You know. What was it like walking that tightrope? Because obviously you, you're writing it, and as you're writing it, you're like, okay, this is gonna be such a great thing, and then you get to set, and you're like, well, I do actually also have to do that. And, and yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what rehearsals are for. Yeah. You know, I think the writers in us kind of put that away and just got to make the film, which includes rewriting and keep working, but, you know, at some point you're acting in the movie, I'm directing, but we're same creative team, same creative the whole way. But I also think like there's like a, there was a great like BS checker between the two of us like where I could kind of go for things and I'm like, hey, if this is too much or too weird, like like, you know, I, I there was there was such trust here through and through yeah. that I felt that even on set, you know, we'd rehearse stuff, but sometimes things existed differently when you kind of expose it to air. Yeah. You know. Okay, we have to talk about the rom com genre. 
for a minute because we do also have to kind of salute the box office success of anyone but you. Oh, thanks. I mean, you've now hit 83 million. We're, we're closing in on that hundred. A bazillion. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yes, it'll on be a bazillion, a bazillion by tomorrow. A bazillion. Yeah. <laughs> but it really feels as if, and this film is, of oh. course, part of that. You're very much uh, reviving the rom-com oh, genre. Rom-com is back. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to Glenn Powell. Well, and the reason why I ask that is because your good friend Kate Hudson very much mentioned that it's very hard to get men to make rom-coms yeah. right now. Why has it been a, a genre that has interested you so much? And just seeing the value in it, what do you hope Hollywood recognizes about these types of movies? I mean, at least for me, look, I've always been a fan of movies in general, and I always find it to be um, silly when certain actors diminish certain genres because yeah. you go at, at its best execution it gives an audience such joy and it's so fun and as an actor you do get to play a lot of gears and so to kind of scoff at just a genre and, and look down on it I always found it kind of silly um, but for me I mean anyone but you was such a a treat to see audiences dance out of the theater and feel so happy after watching a, a movie and, and to see box office not you know stick but grow has been such a, a cool lesson that sometimes the genres that are forgotten are the ones that audiences are craving the most absolutely i mean what is your hope similarly then for hitman because this is as you mentioned a very cross genre film there's a lot of different things at play here no murder in anyone but you <laughs> uh but <laughs> yeah we were like at our some points we're like we're kind of a dark rom-com, you know, like we, yeah. we were in that territory. Some, some weeks we were in, you know, body heat, nine and a half weeks. Some weeks we were in dead, when you're per teaching, you know, we're in Dead Poet Society or something. You know, we were different yeah. movies were coming and going. But yeah, I, I would accept dark, dark rom-com. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's like fun. Gary's going through an identity crisis and we have yeah. sort of a wonderful identity crisis in terms of genre and tone in this movie that I find to be kind yeah. of the joy of it, you know, it never sticks to one the tropes of one specific thing. But I wish that people would take more chances. Like, the history of movies are these really big conceptual comedies. At some point, they started calling them rom-coms, but they were just comedy. They were just movies. Bringing up Baby, a rom-com? Uh, yeah, but it's, you know, it's all these other things. So I never quite got the distinction, but... Um, well, like, you could look at, like, Silver Linings Playbook as a, a rom-com, yeah. you know? Yeah, There's great a, execution. A great comedy is a lot of things at once, so. I love that y'all mentioned Dead Poets Society because I was also getting, a, like, a hint of Indiana Jones, too. I was almost <laughs> waiting for... <laughs> our our just Paleolithic, a little bit. Just we, a little we bit. Yeah. Neolithic, Paleolithic period. <laughs> yeah, we kind of we kind of went heavy-handed. He kind of got an Indiana Jones like flavor to his right. his dress you're at that point. To, you're ready to uh, go. I will not be playing Indiana Jones now. Um, Harrison Ford would yeah. would kill me. <laughs> um, but I think I think we you know there were some funny gear shifts. Like when we shot this movie, we started off with all the stuff with Audria. Yeah, we had to do um, that first. And so then when you kind of shifted gears to a lot of the Gary stuff. The it really the police did. station and the, the police, police station and all that. yeah it it took on it, it felt like we were shooting a completely separate movie so and kind of forecasting how those things kind of merge and collide you know it, yeah. it was really fun to kind of watch in the final you know as we started assembling it you really saw the uh uh the identity crisis happening in real time <laughs> yeah, as much as i love this this uh, bromance here. You've been hanging out with some other guys as well, Glenn, lately. Jay is actually in the other room. Jay Ellis? Yes. Oh, hell yeah. He'll be I here in a moment. Last night. I was wondering, I was like, do you guys have like a Top Gun like text chain? Is there a thing? Yeah. What is that? What is it called? Uh, uh, it's, it's an emoji. It's up gun. <laughs> <laughs> who was the first person to, who was the first person to text on it when the, the news of three being in the works broke? Um, that's, uh, I think it was just a bunch of question marks. I think people looked at me like I knew what was going on. I had, you know, I mean, it's, there, there's, there's, there's going to be some, some fun stuff uh, being announced soon, but um, I, 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 it, it was confidential to me. I, yeah, yeah. I was a part of a movie. I had no idea. Well, <laughs> it was like, I know you can't tell me anything because you, you don't know anything yet, but how excited are you there's to get insider. back to insider information there's inside it's, a, it's knowledge above my pay grade around. yeah man. I mean, sorry you know, man if they told me they'd have to kill me i i on 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 top gun look i talk to kaczynski all the time i talk to Cruz all the time and jerry 
Um, I know there's, there's stuff happening. It sounds very exciting, but uh, I don't know when I'll be going back to Miramar or North Island or whatever. I'll, I'm, sure, I'm sure there's a jet waiting for me somewhere in the future, but we'll see when. Listen, we've got to get the Blue Angels doc out first. There's a few things I know. going on. Um, last thing, because we are celebrating 40, the 40th anniversary of Sundance, two of your films on that top 10 list. Now, what was it like to have that re reception and reaction and everyone remembering um, you know, just how memorable it was to see those debut here? Yeah, that's, that's super flattering. I mean, I've never ha not had a great Sundance experience, but I've been here so many times over the years. So if people are still remembering the films or the times they had. And, but Sundance offers that for so many. It felt kind of, I felt bad. They picked 10 films. I mean, there's been 100 Sundance, at least just incredible screenings where the audience was just saw something new and amazing. It was, you know, the audiences here are so great. They're looking for something new. And Sundance gives that opportunity, and it's done that. I, it feels weird to be whittled down to 10, because I know there's 100. I, I can just imagine so many filmmakers going, what about that screening? I, you can't get any better than the screening we had for so many movies. And so that experience has been, but yeah, I'm of course flattered to be on there a couple times. But you know, it's, it's history. I guess I've been here a lot. <laughs> there's a reason, I, yeah, I, I've had the most at bats, probably. <laughs> Such and a Rick way to that's, phrase that's, that's it. I've probably, probably had the most Sundance at best. So yeah. It would make sense. Uh, well, we're also, because we're talking about the various forms of storytelling, because um, of course we are here with Audible as well. Yeah. I'm curious for you all, what do you look at as the future of audio storytelling as a medium? I mean, times sure have changed. I spend so much time now where I used to just go to movies I spend so much time now with headphones on, listening to podcasts, listening to books on tape, listening to, we're getting so much of our uh, narrative and fictional information through our ears. So I don't know, it's a product of our times. I don't know, it's, it's exciting. I don't know what it means for movies. I, I don't know. It's like know. almost like no, listen to yeah, I love, I love I have storytelling. Love it reminds me, it's kind of old school radio too. It's something very fundamental, basic about it goes back to the 30s or 40s, you know, they'd have series and why not? It's like the new old school radio, so. I just, I just did it one of the like an Audible uh, narrative podcast and I got to kind of like assemble a lot of friends. Cause like when you talk about like uh, scheduling a movie, you know, you have to like, yeah. there's so much prep involved and all this stuff. Yeah, and, and then people I are can, dropping everything to work. Yeah, with. and there's yeah. like a bit of vulnerability in it that like, you know, it's a little more public. And then sometimes like yeah. with, when I did this podcast, I could pull a bunch of my friends. We got to play around in a booth, like create something really special, which kind of feels like. Yeah, it's not so high stakes. No, I just, and it feels like you're just getting to fun, yeah. do some, you know, fun in a booth with, with no. folks. And then, and then it's actually really entertaining because you're engaging also like on a performance level people are listening to you, it's like a little more vulnerable. Like I actually didn't expect it to be as, people are hypersensitive to stuff. Mm -hmm. Performances, I thought you'd have to sell it more. You actually have to sell it less because people are kind of engaging, uh, they're listening to performance in a different way. It's really yeah. fun. People, we, we want stories, we want to be, we want to share information, we want to share stories and characters and what we're all doing here. No, it's, it's, it's kind of incredible. I'm, hey, I'm just ready for the next, the fifth collaboration between y'all. <laughs> we are too, man. Yeah, we're, we're, we're figuring it out. Ready. We're figuring it out. It'll happen. It's, yeah, nothing specific yet. But you'll, you'll make sure to tell me. It's okay. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm ready yeah, no. for it whenever it's time. Are you ready to oh, tell no. him, Rick? Are you ready? <laughs> <laughs> I, I got to get y'all out of here, but yeah. thank you so much. The film is so much fun. I can't wait oh. until everybody gets a chance to see it and well, the teaser to come out and all of the things. Thanks but, for checking yeah, it out. It's, it's so really good. nice talking to you. Yeah, this <laughs> is fun. Talking to you too. <laughs>